Mr. Krein, can you tell us about what the market is doing right now? Because the Wall Street Journal is telling us that it's the end of the world again, right? So, Well, considering I was the largest REO broker in the country and I still train and coach the top REO brokers, uh, we kind of like the end of the world. Yeah. That's a very good thing for our people. They're all going to make a tremendous amount of money. All right. Um, you know, you're asking a very broad question. I get the feeling you're looking for a specific answer. Um, do I think it's the end of the world? Not, no, for a lot of reasons. Do I think there'll be a massive drop in prices? In some markets, yes. In most markets, no. Do I think there's going to be a huge wave of foreclosures? I don't have to think. It's already happening. We can see it in the numbers. So you tell me what your audience wants to hear, you know, and for those of you who don't know me or haven't heard me speak, I'm kind of like the Howard Stern of real estate. I don't give a damn what I say. I'm retired. What any of you do with your lives is not going to impact me in the least. So if well, I can help you, great. If I can't, it's up to you. So I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you I'll, whatever you want to know. I'll tell you what, since I'm filling in for Sean, why don't I, why don't I run you through the, some of the stuff that we were looking at on our end? What do you want and, to know? And, and then after that, I'll open it up to the audience and, and they can work it as well. So it starts, I don't have the story up in front of me, but the Wall Street Journal was talking about realtors are looking for second jobs. Um, some of the rumblings that I've seen in the news groups, I'm sure you guys have all seen this too, is in many areas, uh, you know, home sales are down, listings are drying up, interest rates, right, have come back up. And so, like from what you're from what you're saying, it's it's probably not going to be 2008. This is not Armageddon, but we're we're going to see in various markets, right? We'll see dropouts. Okay. All right, you mentioned about six things today. Let's start with the realtors. Yes, there's going to be a massive contraction, and most realtors, their new phrase is going to be, "May I supersize that for you, sir?" Okay, and that's purely a function of mathematics. When we talk about transactions, the number of houses sold. That's one number, but as realtors, we're either on the listing side or the selling side. So we're not really talking about transactions. We talk about sides. And that's a really important distinction because we get paid per side. Unless of course you double end one, but you counted as two deals, but it's still one transaction. So remember the math guys. And right now the media is so biased on so many different levels. On the same news feed, I'll see one delinquencies are up, one delinquencies are down. And, and nobody's lying. It's just kind of how you count. So the old expression, believe only half of what you hear, half of what you see and none of what you hear. I mean, that's kind of it. Do your own thinking for you. So let's start with the realtors. And that goes back to transaction count number of sides. We were running about 6 million transactions a year. That's 12 million sides. It was a listing agent and a buyer's agent, right? Typically. Now, I'm going to speak in very round numbers to make it simple, because without a whiteboard and a calculator, we're all going to get lost, including me. So I'm going to keep it simple. The transaction count for this year will probably drop down to about 4 million transactions. That means we just lost a third of all transactions, right? Now, NAR likes to say they have 1.4 or 1.5 million realtors. I know they lost 100,000. Well, that's because it was January and everybody's dues were due and they couldn't pay them. Okay, that happens every year. All right. Realistically, there's about 3 million licensees in the country. Okay. Not everyone's a realtor, obviously. With that being said, you had about 3 million agents and you had 12 million sides. So there are about four deals per agent or per broker. We're going to use the term agent broker interchangeably here till we get into some of the differences later. So you had about four sides per person in the industry. Now, does that mean everybody did four? No, but if I had to look at the mode, now, NAR will tell you that the average agent, which is the mean, is about seven to eight transactions a year. That is the mean. But the mode, which is the most frequent number to occur, is probably about 3.5. Meaning if I had to make a bet on any one agent, and I said they do 3.5 a year, that's when I would be right the most often. Because that average, that mean of seven to eight, is skewed by the top producers. We have agents who do 100 transactions a year. Hell, I had years when I did over 3,000, and I did that with a team of 14, so it can be done. But that skews the numbers. So you have a lot of agents who didn't sell anything. But what you do have is you just decrease the number of sides and opportunities by one third. So people who were struggling before, there's now one third less business for them. You better get used to that fact. As a realtor and a broker, 
I don't care if the market's going up or going down. I care that transactions are occurring. I get paid either way. All right, so stop worrying about, oh, the market's going up, the market's going down. Nobody cares. Look at the transaction count because you don't get paid when a house appreciates. You get paid when you sell it. Okay, and that's transaction. So let's get that straight. So yes, there's going to be a huge sucking sound and exit from the industry. You already had way too many people come into it because they thought it was easy. You're also seeing a very different change in the consumer and that the consumer is much better educated. Now, let's be hardcore and real about this. Okay, when you take a listing, another agent brings an offer. By the time you're there listing the close, do you really have more than 10 hours in that transaction? And if you do, you're doing a lot of things wrong because you shouldn't. Okay, it's just not that hard, guys. And all this time, oh, I spent all these hours. No, you were bullshitting on the phone instead of just getting business done. That's what most agents do. They're social butterflies. Get rid of that. But let's take it to this. Average sales price in the U.S. about 400000 Listing side, 3%. That's 12000 for about 10 hours worth of work. Can all of you tell me you're worth $1,200 an hour? You may think you are, and maybe you are. Can you convince a consumer that you're worth $1,200 an hour? They don't pay their doctors. Hell, I don't pay my lawyers that, okay? And you took a 40 or 90 or a 60 hour real estate course and you wanna make more than someone who spent 12 years in school like a doctor, you better be able to back that up with some value because the consumers are wising up. And because the drop in transactions and a better educated consumer, that's gonna create competition, okay? I talk to realtors all day long. Oh, I would never do that. I don't work for less than 6%. Then I got news for you. You may not work at all because somebody's going to come off and do it for five. Someone's going to come off. To, there's going to be intense competition on pricing. And I'm careful about discussing pricing and commissions, the antitrust issues. So, But you better start rethinking your life. Do you want to try to do one transaction a year at six or do you want to do 10 transactions a year at five? Start doing some math, guys, because the competition is going to get fierce. So... If you want that 6%, you better be able to provide the value. And not just you think you're worth it. The consumer, that's the buyer, the seller has to think you're worth it. Worth it. So you better start pushing your value proposition. You better understand what your own value proposition is. I could ask all of you on the call right now, what is your value proposition? Why should I pay you this? And most of you won't have an answer for me. And that's the reality. It should be written down. It should be real. And that's really what it comes down to on that. But competition will be much, much worse. Now, as far as numbers and the agents, um, show of hands for those I can see or type in the chat. How many of you have heard of the 80-20 rule of real estate? Okay. Have you ever heard the term Pareto's theorem? I'm good, a math geek, but Janet, she actually knows something good because that's been around for a very long time. That's been around since I started this business 30 something years ago. The reality is, and it was true back then, the reality is in most markets, when you run the numbers, it's 93 and 7. That means 7% 7 of the agents control 93% of the business. Okay, that is scary. That number is not going to widen. It's going to tighten due to technology. The smarter agents and brokers use technology, use assistance. That's really what's forced that. And it's going to get even tighter. So the first thing I would say is you better get up to speed on your technology. You better get up to speed on your marketing and you damn well better have a reason for somebody to pay you and be able to justify what you want to charge. Because one of the things that Tim said earlier is interest rates rising. He said it twice during his opening, right? People do not buy by the price. They buy by the payment typically, unless you're an investor. Okay. How many of you would take a $2 million house for me if I could make the payments $1,500 a month? Well, yeah, exactly. People shop by payment. So the consumer is now being priced out due to payment, not price of the house itself. That's the difference we have to look at. And so housing is becoming less affordable. So you need to be able to solve people's problems. People will pay you anything you want if you can take away their pain and solve their problems for them. All right. That, so you're going to see a lot more work going on. It's one of the projects I'm working on. This is going to be a lot more affordable housing projects. There's going to be a lot more initiatives on that road. And that is your buyers, because there's something else going on that you have to be aware of. First of all, if I was a broker today, I would stop reading the national papers, and the national news, because it's irrelevant to you in your local market. Real estate is hyper local. 
I don't care what's going on in California if I'm in Florida right now. I want to need to know what my market is. We also have what we're calling political refugees. We have heavy migrations from blue states to red states. So if you're in a blue state, there's going to be plenty of listings for you. And if you're a red state, you're going to have plenty of buyers. That's just how it works. Now, also means a listing is worth a lot more in a red state because it's a hell of a lot easier to sell than it is in a blue state. Just supply and demand is different in every market, but track the patterns. If you don't know what type of market you're in, how are you going to target what you're doing effectively? So I'd focus on that very hard to know what your own market is. Um, some other things. The reason I don't think prices will fall too badly in most markets is because of supply issue. Demand hasn't really shifted that much. Uh, when I started selling real estate, interest rates were around 14%. And guess what? We still sold houses. I was still selling houses at 12%. And when they dropped to 11, we got so busy, we didn't know what to do with ourselves because everybody was afraid they were going to go back up to 18. So they all came out and bought. That's how the markets work. Buyers will adjust to interest rates. Sellers will not. Here's the real problem we're facing. All right. There's two groups of buyers that will always purchase regardless of economic conditions and interest rates. First one is new Americans. Immigrants to this country who are capable of purchasing a house, which means they came in legally, they've got a green card, they've got a real job. They will buy regardless of interest rates because it's been their dream to own a home in America. So it's a nice niche to top into. You, these people will buy houses at 50%. They don't care. They want a home in America. Easiest market to tap into if you understand what you're doing. Second is first-time home buyers. And this we joke about because we've been hearing for 15 years about the millennials, the millennials, all oh, the millennials are coming. Well, they didn't show up. The millennials are just starting to buy now, 15 years after we were told to expect them. Oh, the market won't go bad. The millennials are coming out. No, they're just showing up now. So first-time buyers. We also know that uh, probably going forward for the next few years, first-time buyers, about 40% Hispanic. And another trend you really ought to watch when you're targeting your marketing is more single women buy homes than single men do. That's the first time in history. Okay, so you need to start looking at these. And you need to learn your own demographics. But what's going to keep prices up is a shortage of inventory in most markets. And let me explain this. There's a term known as rate locked, all right? And that is people aren't selling their homes. When I started this business, a first home or condo, which a young couple would buy, they turn it over in three to five years and buy a regular house, full house, okay? And when we figured on average, it was about seven years at a home. Well, that's 14 years and rising right now. So you're not gonna have turnover in velocity. And again, we don't care about pricing. We care about transactions and that's velocity. So you want to pay attention to that. What's happening right now, if I went to, let's pick on Todd because he laughs at my jokes. I like Todd. Can you unmute? Yeah, Todd, let me see. I'll do ask to unmute. Quit What's scratching that? your nose, Todd. And talk to me. You know what? I'm going to talk to Jan instead. She okay, well, yeah, yeah. Let's, do, let's do Jan. I think Todd is, he's doing math. Todd zoned out on me. It's, you know, it's that time of the week, so. Oh, God, it's good. Yeah, but I start my day at 4 a.m. That's how I well, get everything You know, my, actually, goes. Michael, before, before we go to Janet, you have you have some projects. I promised you, I promised, I said, because he, these folks don't know me that well. I beg and grovel, like, it's horrible. And, <laughs> and so I said, please speak for us, please. And I said, Plug all of your stuff. Tell us what you're working on. So, so what what are the sites that people should be looking at? All right. Um, if you're in the brokerage and an agent or a broker, Rio Genesis, that's actually my software company. That is the system that was designed to run my offices. And for those of you who don't know me, I've not only owned multiple real estate offices, I've owned regions for franchises. Okay. I've had plenty of offices. This is my system built for us to run the type of transaction volume. And I'll give you another number. We know the mode for per transactions per agent is about 3.5. In my operations across seven offices, it was 14.7. I was running three to four times the production of any other office around me, right? And we did that with systems. So that's the software we built. And I could spend three days showing you everything it does, but most of you don't want to bother to learn anything new. So stay where you're at, I'm okay. But if you actually want to do something and get your business running efficiently, it's RioGenesis.com. I don't really pitch the NRBA, which is the National REO Brokers Association. We are the top REO brokers in the industry. We do all the bank and foreclosure work. And they're not even banks anymore, but that's another story. So we have about 600 members. 
All of them would be considered one percenters in the industry, real estate wise, as far as number of transactions and earnings. Uh, that is a very select group. You cannot just apply. Um, you better have a couple of years of REO experience and several clients and a lot of transactions under your belt because we expect you to have your bachelor's and we're like grad school. So we are the top brokers. We do all the instruction, training, legal updates. We do the marketing to the clients. We have relationships with the clients. That's what we do. So we do that. Um, I do have another website I started and I'm about to put out a bunch more videos. And anybody who knows me know this. I hate most real estate coaches. I really do because, and I shouldn't say that because there are some good ones that really are. I've been on stage with all of them over the years, at least most of them. Some of them are really good, but most of them will teach you just enough for you to keep paying them, never enough to make you successful because if they made you successful, you wouldn't need them anymore. So that kind of pissed me off and one in particular did. So I started this site called Free Broker School. It's everything you need to know about real estate, but no one else will ever teach you. Okay, this is hardcore stuff. This is what I train my people. And a lot of them do over a thousand transactions a year. So we start talking about 100, 200, 300 transactions. That's like baby steps for us. So if you're only doing 10 and you're struggling, you're doing it wrong. That's all I can tell you. Problem isn't the market. The problem is you. Put the work in, change what you're doing. But it's freebrokerschool.com. Pretty much everything you want to know about how real estate really works and how to run an office, how to be an agent. I mean, I can take anybody. Give me five or 10 minutes a day teach you one thing a day, I'll have you a mega producer in a year. It's just not that hard. And I do want to tell you something else. Most agents are not successful because they're not doing the right things. They're not successful because they're doing too many of the wrong things. Like talking through a close. I mean, baby mistakes, but it's funny the things, the habits you get into. Okay. And I'm not perfect by any means. The reason I can share all this with you, if there's a way to screw something up in this business, trust me, I found it usually twice before I figured it out. So whatever there is to do wrong and every mistake, I've made it. So, but let's go back to, let's talk to Janet if she's unmuted. Yeah, yeah, Jan how you doing, Janet's Janet? unmuted. Great, how are you? I'm doing well, it's just a long day for me. This is the end of my day. So here's the problem with the inventory and why the markets won't really crash per se. And I have the foreclosure numbers and the delinquency numbers. I can quote a multi if you wanna hear them. Here's what's happening. Janet, you're in your house. I can see it behind you. Assuming that isn't one of those little, I don't know, whatever <laughs> no, image you can do on me. Zoom. Okay. <laughs> so let's put Janet in her house. She's been there about three years. Janet has a two and a half percent mortgage, right? She got a few years ago. Janet's house, I'm going to say it's worth 400000 right? Okay. Janet's about to have another kid. Needs a bigger house. Let's go with that just because it's fun. All right. Here's Janet's problem. She's rate locked. Yeah. If Janet needs a larger house, she's got to sell it for $400,000, maybe spend $600,000. Okay, that's normal. The problem is she'd be giving up her 2.5% mortgage on $400,000 for a 7% mortgage on $600,000. Her payment doesn't go up by a third. It doubles or better. She is rate locked. It makes no sense for her to upgrade and trade up. That's what we're losing in this market. And you have to understand this because this goes back to velocity of a neighborhood and how you target marketing. And that's kind of the three house life cycle. Okay. But Janet, would you give up your two and a half percent mortgage for a 7% right now? Or would you make do with where you're at? Hey, it's a baby. How big can it be right now? Well, I'm going to make it twins. <laughs> would you leave now? Oh, well, I can tell you what a typical buyer would say. And I'll tell you what I would say. A typical buyer is going to look at that rate lock and say, no, I'm going to suggest that they not look at the rate lock. I'm going to suggest that over the course of their life, they're going to be buying and selling homes and don't get hung up on the rate at this moment because history shows they go up and down. You're correct. So we're going to talk about buying the house and or buying the price and dating the rate. Yep. By the way, guys, if you don't know what that close is, you better learn it because that's about the most powerful one you can have right now. And it it works. Yep. But you're right about that. But most people act out of fear and fear of loss. Okay. I mean, you don't really sell somebody a house. You tell them they can't have it and they want to buy it. That's how people operate. They operate of fear of loss. But the rate locking issue is what's holding inventory back. All right. So people who are stuck or got a two and a half percent mortgage will not give that up for a 7% mortgage. Normally these people trade up. Something changes in their lives. Their family grows. They want more space. They're not trading up. 
That's why we lost the seven year cycle to the 14 year cycle. All right, the trade up buyers aren't there. So inventory is gonna be restricted due to rate locked buyers. So regardless of the end of the world coming, prices probably won't drop down that much. And there's some other things that nobody likes to talk about as far as housing pressure. One of these is everybody needs four walls and a roof. Yeah. Okay, everybody's got to live somewhere. And I'm not going to get into the politics because this is what I tell my people. We don't care who's in office. Okay, whatever policies they come up with, we're going to figure out how to make a buck off of it. Okay, so we don't care. We don't get political. I don't care what they do. Okay, because whatever they do, whether it's Democrats, or Republicans, I'm going to figure out how to make a buck. That's all we care about. So we're going to leave politics out of this and just deal with the reality. How many hundreds of thousands or millions of people do we have coming across the border right now? I have no idea. But I do know that everybody needs four walls and a roof. Okay, so what you've got going on is all this immigration coming in, whether it's legal or illegal, I'm not even going to get into, but they're putting pressure on the lowest segment of the housing market. The most affordable housing is what's being pressured the most. Okay, we saw this back in the 80s in New York when Iran fell and all the Persians came over. And yes, guys, they're not Arabs, they're Persians. Okay, and I think the first English word they learned was screw broker. Okay, <laughs> they were tough. Okay, it's just a, it's a cultural thing, they'll negotiate forever, and that's okay, you deal with it. The point is, they would come over and eight of them would live in one apartment. Okay, and they'd sleep on the carpet. And you go, how horrible. But you know what? Some of these people used to sleep on dirt. This was a step up in their lives. So you have to remember, everybody's trying to improve their life. Okay? Just because you would live that way doesn't mean it's better than how somebody else was living before. So you've got all these people putting pressure on the low-income housing. Okay? Look at the homeless problem we have in this area. In the country, rather. Okay? So aren't, there is a housing shortage. With the supply chain issues, you can't build. You can't get materials. Prices are too high. All right, people are backing out of new construction and still the builders are backing off. What was it? KB reported 68% cancellation on their contracts last quarter as a home builder and permit filings are way down. So no matter how you look at it, we've got increased demand for housing stock, especially in the lower, more affordable aspects of it. We've got people who won't sell their current home and trade. So what you're going to have is certain segments of the market that are liquid and certain that aren't. And I'm going to go back to Janet because I don't, because she's the only one who wants to talk to me. Janet, where are you, by the way? I'm sorry, what did you say? Okay. Where are you? I live on the magical island of Martha's Vineyard. Okay. Oh, that's a tough one for this analogy, but I'm going to wing it anyway. <laughs> okay, so if I was trying to spend $500,000 at Martha's Vineyard, would I have a chance? No. Million. Better. Okay. But it'd probably be tough to find something for a million? Uh, no. I can get you something. It depends on. Okay, uh, you're not playing this game correctly. Okay, tell me it's tough. Okay, imaginary market. Let's go to Las Vegas. Huge incoming. Okay, where anything under three hundred thousand, you're not going to be able to get. All right, but back to, to Janet, just to understand this. But Janet, if I had ten million to spend in Martha's Vineyard, can you find me houses? Which which order view order front do you want? Oh, so so there's wait, I thought there's a housing shortage and there's no inventory. <laughs> you guys see in my point here, everybody's talking about oh, there's no inventory, there's a housing shortage. No, there isn't people, affordable housing people shortage. Call me all the time and they'll go, there's no inventory. And I'm like, do you want me to tell you how many properties are on the market right this minute? There's uh -huh. inventory. You have to decide is it the price you want to pay? Is it the location where you want to live? But there's inventory. The inventory hasn't gone away. That's my point. Everybody's whining about the wrong things. And this is what I mean about working smart and not hard. So if I know there's no inventory for $500,000, I am not going to market for $500,000 buyers, if I'm Janet. Okay? But if I know there's a ton of inventory at 10, I'm going to market for $10 million buyers. Now, the exact opposite is going to hold true. If there's plenty of $10 million houses, I don't want one of those listings. Why? Because I'm competing against everybody else's listing. But Janet, if you got a $500,000 listing, how fast could you sell it? It would be sold. Bingo. This is what I mean about working smart versus hard. Target your market. You want to work the buyers in the price ranges where there are inventory. You want to work the listings in the price ranges where there is no inventory. All right? Be smart about this. This is what agents do wrong all the time. They don't... Uh, Thank you, Thomas. Somebody's paying attention. I even got one of these. I'm happy today. 
Okay, these are things you can do. The data is all there. Okay, all you really need is to spend a little time, actually put in a little effort and look at your market, build a value proposition, then a decent CRM and a little social media and you're good to go. It's not rocket science, but people chase the wrong things. How many of you have ever walked away from a listing? Most agents won't, okay? They'll take it and try to break it later and hope it happens. Or how many of you will work with buyers? I can't tell you. You know, oh, the market is so tough. I've shown this buyer 40 houses and we can't find him anything. And I'm like, you're a moron. You're not a social worker. How are you planning to feed your kids? You're gonna be bankrupt, okay? You wanna be paid to help people? You know, spend time at work for free. Be, I don't know, be, well, I'm a people person. Be a social worker. You know, come on, guys. All right. You're working the wrong market. You're not being smart about this. At the end of the day, you have a family to feed. You have bills to pay. And I'm not saying being a mean person or not a nice person, but for God's sakes, be a smart person, not a charity. I can't tell you how many agents, oh, I showed them this many houses. Oh, I'm going to take them out anyway. I'm like, why? They can't buy anything? Well, you never know. Yeah, you do. Be smart about it. Okay. So work the inventory in the right markets. Look for listings in the segments where it's tight. Work the buyers where it's loose. Okay. Otherwise, you're spinning your wheels right now. Um, one of the really nice things, and I would strongly suggest you learn REO and foreclosures, not to list them because most of you will never get in. It takes years to work your way into contracts. Unless you got three years, learn to sell them. I will give you a little estimate right now. So how are we doing time-wise, Tim? Oh, yeah. Well, it, actually, it's pretty open-ended today. You know, usually oh, okay. Sean has a hard stop, but I'm, I'm mellow. Although, if it is okay, I do want to jump in. Let me do oh. Let me do a couple plugs for our stuff, and, and I do have a, another question. So, okay, um, got to do your plug. Yeah, I, I got to do a plug for iconcoaching.com, especially the accelerated breakthrough program. Um, so guys, this is, it's a 16 week program. It is uh, just about $500. This is basically a compilation of everything that Sean Kokoska has come up with. I put this together for him. I mean, he, he created the program. I reorganized it when we moved websites. You have to trust me on this. This thing is, it, it is overwhelming, absolutely overwhelming. I was amazed. So I, I would, absolutely mention that also uh paul hellum put this in chat and he can ping that back in if you guys have questions please schedule a call with paul hellum it doesn't necessarily have to be a sales question it could be about anything related to coaching he can either give you advice point you in the right direction or if coaching is the solution he can kind of get you started with that um one of the things and this is what i want to ask michael about next so one of the things one of the reasons that I came on board with Sean is because Sean knows teams better than anyone else I have ever, ever met. And I've been in, I've been in this industry for probably about 12 years now. And um, there are lots of team owners out there. I, I think one of the things is it's, it tends to be kind of one of those secret skills, right? You don't want to tip off the competition too much. I heard Sean speak on this. And actually, this is on our YouTube channel, Buried Somewhere. And that for me was, I, I was like, oh my God, someone actually has a roadmap, who to hire, how to hire them, where to put them, when to hire them, what to compensate them, the whole nine yards. And one of the things that I wanted to ask Michael about now um, was if you have time, do you have any tips for team owners? Because one of the things that I'm wondering is a lot of these folks have built teams over this good market. And what do you do with your team if your market starts to come to bottom out? Are there any quick tips for that? Or There's no quick tips to running a team. I am personally not a fan of teams. I'm a fan of employees. There's a big difference. Okay. Now, I wrote an article. I forget where it was published years ago. You can Google it. It's called The Trouble with Teams. One of the problems with teams is your attrition rate. If you're a broker, and again, I've owned C21s, better homes and gardens, sell states, independents. Uh, trust me, did a lot of recruiting and dealt with attrition. Attrition and brokerage is about 30% a year. The problem with teams is you still have that attrition. Say you have 10 people at the beginning of the year, you're going to lose two at the end. The problem with the team is guess which two you lose, your two best ones, because you took them in, you spoon fed them leads, you taught them the business, and they don't need you anymore. 
Okay. So then you have to bring two more people in, but these are new and weak. So, and I'll bet any of you on this, I want you to look at your own markets and look at the top teams. I guarantee you most of them don't last more than three years. I'll make that bet with any of you right now. Would you agree or disagree? Okay. Because if you're not constantly recruiting your team and you're not retaining, you're going to lose your top 20% and replace them with weak agents each time. And although a team may start out strong the first year, they usually don't survive three years. So that's one of the issues with teams. Now, what I can tell you is when a market gets tough and I don't see the market as tough, I love these kind of markets because the weak get out and the rest of us clean up. Okay, so don't look at this as a bad market. Look at this as a great opportunity. If you're smart enough to put the work in and actually learn your business, okay, you're going to clean up because everybody else is going to fall by the wayside. Um, interestingly enough, when you talk to realtors today, and especially when you're recruiting, the majority of them want to know about leads. Okay, do you know if I went back 10 years and I asked the top five things an agent would want to be recruited on, leads wasn't even on the list back then? This is an old term that most of you, unless you've been around as long as some of us have, you won't understand the difference between agent-centric and broker-centric in an office or operation. Janet probably does. You've been around a while, obviously, from her comments. Okay, what's interesting is the agents all want to be paid 100% like an agent-centric office, but they're all demanding the services of a broker-centric office. It's a really interesting little conundrum right now. So for teams, you need to control the lead generation. And you need to hold them hostage to it, basically treat them like crack addicts, okay, where they're dependent upon you for the leads, otherwise they're going to walk, all right? And that's really what it's coming down to right now. So the first thing I would do is kick up your lead gen. And the other thing I would tell you, and this is true whether it's a team or an office, agents are kind of like goldfish. How many of you had a pet goldfish as a kid? You remember what happens when you overfeed them? They die. Agents do the same thing. One of the biggest mistakes I see in teams is they do all this lead generation, spend all this money, and they overload their agents. Because let me tell you exactly what will happen. Human nature says that all of us will do the least amount possible for the maximum return. In other words, we'll work just as hard as we have to. Okay, that's just human nature. Other than maybe 5 10% of us who are self-actualizing don't care, we'll just go do it. Most people won't. If I give an agent 20 leads a month, you know what they're going to do with those 20 leads? They're going to wait for the lay down. Old school term, all right? A lay down is somebody on their cell phone standing in front of the house say, hey, I'm in front of 123 Main Street. I want to buy this house on my checkbook. Can you meet me? That's a lay down. Well, guess what? We've all had them. You will get a lay down. When you give an agent 20 leads a month, they're going to get a lay down once in a while. And you know what happens? They'll get spoiled and they won't work the other leads. So the more you give them, and this is what's really funny. And if any of you have run large offices, you've tested this theory. The more leads you give an agent, the lower their production actually goes. It's really funny to watch, but it happens. Because what they'll do is they'll throw 90% of the leads away and only take the laydowns. They won't actually work them. All right? So that's what tends to happen with teams. Oh, my production is dropping. I got to spend more money and buy more leads. And you're actually driving your agent's production down. Okay? Something else you need to understand. And I've got two people that work with me at the NRBA that are running insane teams. And I'll share that story with you in a minute. So what you also have to understand is everybody has what's known as a comfort zone. The term in the real estate industry used to be soccer moms, which sounds kind of sexist because it's soccer dads too, but it's an old term. And basically a large portion of your agents, usually about 60% right in the middle, they're never gonna do more than eight deals a year because they don't have to. They want enough money to pay their rent, pay their car payment, go to lunch with the girls or the guys and go show up at the kid's soccer game. And it doesn't matter what you do, how many leads you give them, they're not going to earn any more because they're in a comfort zone in their life. All right. And what you have to understand, whether you're a team owner or a brokerage owner, it doesn't matter. Brokerage is just a big team. All right. People are in a comfort zone. And no matter how much more you do for them, most people won't come out of it. They will make just enough to keep their lifestyle the way it is. So you continually overfeeding them is not going to increase your production. At that point, it becomes a numbers game. So as far as teams, I would keep the leads down to three to five per member per month. This way it forces them to actually work the leads. And then I would stop trying to get a bigger piece of the pie and start going after a larger pie. And if you guys don't understand this, really simple. 
my slice of the pie is going to be this big. Okay, because the pie is like this. Here's my slice. So if I can't increase my slice, I need to get a much bigger pie. So now my slice is this. And you have to think in those terms. All right. So increase your count. It's strictly a body count and numbers game. They're going to hit their comfort zone. And that's 90% of agents will work in a comfort zone financially as well. Maybe one out of 10 won't. But that's also the one that one out of 10 is the one that's going to leave your team and go out on their own. Okay. Once they figure this out. So you're kind of stuck there. So don't overfeed them. Your production will actually go down. Instead, increase the size of your team and distribute the leads more. All right. Also, some sort of incentive with the leads. I just gave you five leads. I gave Thomas five leads this month. Thomas, how many you close? As many as possible. No, no. Seriously, give me an any number. Well, I gave you five leads. How many you close out of five? Yeah, that depends. No. Okay. Uh, give me an answer. Make one up. I don't care. Okay, three. Okay, Thomas close three out of five. Thomas is a god. Okay, that means next month I give Thomas ten. Let's see if he closes six. Now, about one out of ten will. My bet is if I had to make a bet, Thomas will still only close three because Thomas just made twenty grand last month. Thomas is a happy guy. All right. Now, if Thomas said zero, I wouldn't have given him any more. I said, "You're staying at five. If he closes two or three, I will increase his lead count until his production plateaus, because that's when he's hit his comfort zone. You will occasionally find somebody who doesn't have a comfort zone. It's about one out of 10, one out of 15. But that's the person you better hold on to tight and hold them emotionally, because they'll leave you business. They'll go out on their own, unless you have an emotional attachment. So you have to be concerned with that. Um, and that's probably more than you wanted on teams, Tim. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah, and actually, Sean is just pinging me. So he had he just confirmed he does not have a hard stop. Normally, he does today, but again, he is traveling and he is fighting a, 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 apparently a really nasty cold. So, no um, worries. Yeah, no, I I appreciate you filling everybody in. I I get to be woefully ignorant on this. Now, for for my part, I should ask, what are your thoughts on? Uh, lo like local area networking, because I've been lecturing everybody to get busy on their social media accounts and make connections in their local areas. Is there any value in that? Of course there is. The problem is you're all going to start it. You're going to do it for about a week and then stop doing it. It's only has value if it's consistent. And if you can't be consistent about it, pay somebody who will. Let me give you another piece of advice on this. Okay. We talked about how you got about 10, 12 hours into a transaction, realistically, unless you're a chatty Kathy who spends an hour talking to your title rep for no reason. By the way, I was considered the rudest realtor on the appointment. Hi, what do you want? Oh, how are you doing today? I'm fine. What do you want? You were wasting my time. I wasn't rude. I was efficient. But that's where 90% of agents really spend their time is on useless chatter. Okay? So let's do this effectively. Let's go back to that. So you got 10, 12 hours at a transaction, average commission, 12 Gs, $1,000 an hour. Anything you, that's, that's what your time is worth. Your time is $1,000 an hour, apparently, okay? Anything you can pay somebody else to do for you for less than $1,000 is a bargain, okay? So start paying people. You are out there, you're supposed to be closing, you're pros. You should not be doing paperwork. You should not be doing social media, okay? Pay them what they need to be paid. And by the way, do yourself a favor, pay them like a month at a time, because otherwise you're going to have a bad week and then you're not going to pay them, then they're going to quit, and then you're right back to where you started with no consistency. So if you can't bank the first month ahead of time and keep it up, you're just going to quit anyway. All right? Nobody loses in the real estate business. They quit. Okay? The real estate business doesn't beat anybody up. People quit before they win. All right? So yes, you should do that. I will tell you, though, I don't care how good social media is. It still doesn't replace some, meeting somebody in person and talking to them. I used to farm retail strip centers for business. You guys all know what a retail strip center is. Maybe there's a supermarket, there's a pizzeria, there's a Chinese food place. Okay, there's a dry cleaner. You guys have all seen these, yes? You farm them. Talk to my dry cleaner when I was in every week. Every day, I'd go have lunch at a different place. I'd stop at a pizzeria. I'd go to the deli. I'd go to the bagel place. And I talked to everybody behind the counter. Hey, you got anybody for me today? Can I leave my cards up here? Until I got to know them all on a first name basis. Okay. 
because they have 200 people, 300 people coming through their door every day. This is just one little trick you can do, by the way, guys. It's good for two deals a week or two deals a month, I should say, at least. But what I would do, here's the trick to it. And yes, this is legal. So the guy behind the deli counter, I'd say, hey, by the way, Tom, thanks a lot. Uh, that guy you recommended call me. I'm going to sell him a house. And I'd give him a $20 bill as a tip. Now, did he send me anybody? No, he didn't. But guess what he is going to do next time? Send me everyone he can possibly think of. Okay, it's called paying it forward sometimes. But that's one example of farming. You're going to have lunch anyway. Might as well use it and make some money out of it. Doesn't cost you anything. And again, I need 20 minutes to teach you that technique a little better. But these are simple things you can do that cost you nothing. I used to love bowling. Okay. Definitely got a deal or two a month out of the bowling alley. Okay. And I had fun doing it. It was one of the greatest things for social marketing ever. Why? Because every week I'd meet five new guys on the other team. I'd buy a pitcher of beer. And by the end of the night, I had all their names. They had mine. You can pick up deals. We don't social farm enough. And most of you aren't enjoying your life enough. Go out and do something. You'll meet people. People will do business with you because they like you and trust you. So get to know them. You can't do that with social media. And I've kind of talked right through that, but you can't do that with social media. It's not quite the same. Go out and have some fun. Get a life. And if you get a life, you'll get business too. It's really simple. That, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. So we, we, I, we have probably at, at probably at most about 15 minutes left. Uh, Michael, do you think we could open it up and have some folks ask questions? We can. There is one thing I would like you guys to know, and this will actually help you if you pay attention. Some really quick math for you. There's about 90 million home units in the country, condos, single family houses. About 60 million of them have loans on it. One third can never be foreclosed because they don't have mortgages on them. Okay, out of that 60 million, okay, if you took 1% as a delinquency or default rate, that's 600,000 homes at 1%. Okay, that's why REO brokers like their clients. You guys go get one listing, we nail a client, we get 100 listings over time. That's why we do that. And you wonder why I'm in REO, it was purely efficiency. It had nothing to do with liking it, all right, because it actually sucks to be an REO broker, but the money's great. With that being said, that's 600,000 homes. Now, the delinquency rate right now running forward is actually running over 3%. Okay, so for the next five years, you're going to have between 1 and 1.8 million homes foreclosed each year, unless something changes dramatically, which I don't think is going to happen. But let's take that number. Let's just say it's a million. Okay, there's only going to be about 4 million transactions going forward. That means in most markets, one out of four properties is going to be a foreclosure sale. How many of you actually know how to write an offer on a foreclosure correctly so it doesn't get kicked back? And how many of you know not to piss off the listing agent because he has more control than you can possibly imagine? Yeah. Do not piss off the listing agent with dumb questions. Learn to sell REOs. Don't worry so much about HUD. There won't be much HUD inventory. It's going CWCOT instead, which you guys don't know what that means, but it doesn't matter. Just don't worry about HUD too much. There will not be that many HUD homes. They're going a different direction. With that being said, learn how the as is addendums work. When you talk to an REO broker, do not say, well, my buyer is going to do this and we're going to do it like this because I'm going to go click because you know what I know? You don't have a deal because you're not getting this listing. I still have the listing. I'm going to sell it to somebody else tomorrow. All right. Keep in mind, the REO broker, we find most agents annoying. Is this an REO? Yes. Is it a listing? Is it vacant? Yes. Is it a listing too? What do you want from me? When you get 100 calls like this a day, you kind of lose your mind. All right. So understand that. Now, you could have the greatest offer in the world and all that Oreo broker has to, to do, and I'll use Todd as an example because he's paying attention now. All I have to do is tell the asset manager, yeah, this offer is better, but I've dealt with this agent before and he screwed me. And the asset manager go, okay, Mike, take the next offer then. Okay, Just understand that. Do not piss them off. With that being said, the Oreo broker wants that property gone because we work for less. We have a lot more work. It's volume. So the best thing to do is call up the agent and say, hey, look, my buyer wants this. Tell me how I should write it. Because I'll tell you another secret. How many of you have ever met a stupid realtor? Yeah, who's kidding who? Okay, half the contracts and offers we get as REO brokers are wrong and we have to rewrite them. And it's so bad arguing with the dumb agents sometimes that we actually tell them, look, you can have your commission. Just send the buyer and I'll write the damn thing the right way the first time and get this deal done. 
we would rather, it's actually easier and faster for us to do the whole deal and pay the other agent than have them screwing it up. That's our life. Okay. Now, one out of four listings going forward over the next few years, depending on your market, higher or lower, is going to be an REO or default of some sort. It won't say that because we're not allowed to call them that. But understand how those contracts work, how the financing works on them, how the addendums work, and make friends with the REO brokers. And don't piss them off. They have more juice than you think. Okay. If you can do that, you can have a lion's share of the deals because over half the offers that come in the REO have to be rejected. We don't even present them because they're wrong and they're so screwed up, the contracts. If you can just learn to write an offer correctly, you can own that part of the market and have a deal every time, all right? Because they'll work with you. So keep in mind, one out of four properties in most markets, this is what you're dealing with, all right? Other thing is, how many of you have ever done a DPA deal? How many of you know what a DPA is? I'd start learning real fast, down payment assistance programs. There's over 3,000 of them in the United States. And about 40% of all buyers are going to be first-time home purchasers over the next few years as well. Also, you might want to learn Spanish because the percentage will be highest among the Spanish-speaking population. You might want to learn these things. Um, but those are the things I'd be focusing on right now. And understand that is the market shift because the only saleable inventory where the buyer isn't upside down or rate-locked is the foreclosure market. All right, that's the stuff that's going to be the easiest to sell and move the quickest for your buyers. So keep that in mind. Also, what you'll be competing against with your listings going forward. The math doesn't lie. You can look at the numbers yourself. And, and okay, um, so let me see. Parisa has her hand up and then Todd. I think you were going to pick on Todd also. Do you think we could do Todd and then Parisa? Would that work? You do, you do whatever you want. Okay, well, let me, go to, let me go to Todd now that Todd's awake. And he's smiling. He's sort of smiling. He's sort of he, he's embarrassed, but Todd, always what you, smiling. What you got, sir? I didn't have any questions. Oh, maybe he was just maybe he was just using you as a he case keeps, study example. He just knows it. He keeps going like this. Yeah, it's, you guys it's, think it's, I don't pay attention because I'm speaking. I do. I'm just I just love it. Like I mean, I'm 20 years in the business as well, and what Michael's saying is true. It just, I mean. It's just it, it, you get tired of dealing with people that just waste your time, have dumb questions, dumb stuff that it's like, you know, so. Yeah. Well, and again, I, I can't thank Michael. I genuinely cannot thank you enough for speaking today. Uh, you know, I mean, this I, I've been hearing more and more of this, right? It's like the rumble that kind of turns into a roar. And it's kind of like that volume is going up. You know, it's like market issues, housing slowdown, this, that, and the other thing. I know it's regional, but it seems like it's affecting more and more agents. And so when Sean yeah. asked me, you know, he's like, can you find someone, find someone to speak to this? I'm like, I know the guy, right? He's the number <laughs> one. So. Um, we've been talk, We've been prepping our people for 18 months already for this market. And we actually, when somebody actually joins our group, then they're already heavily experienced to get into our group. I mean, you got to be pretty high up. We give them a list of 25 things to get done immediately that they hadn't thought of that need to be done for this market. So there's a lot of prep work. But, you know, sweat now or bleed later, that's your choice. Uh, so let me let me go to Parisa, who is patiently waiting. Yeah, yeah Parisa. Parisa. Hi, Michael. Thanks for the great presentation. So what are the markets for the REO? I'm in San Francisco Bay Area, and obviously we are pretty tight with inventory. Where are you seeing the REO markets, please? Um, first of all, it's everywhere. Okay. Um, what's holding up the REO? I've got agents who are getting, you know, a couple of weeks right now. I have others that aren't. The REOs and the defaults exist. The problem is local codes and moratoriums. And California has some really screwed up laws, okay? And even if it goes to REO and foreclosure and it gets assigned to one of my people, a nonprofit can step in at the last minute before it goes back to the bank and they can step in and try to purchase it for 45 days, which mostly is a waste of time because they never do. But so there's a lot of different things. Now, asking a client, like an REO client, oh, do you have anything in my area? You, you sound like a complete idiot if you ever ask that question. So here's a tip for free. Because even the asset manager, the client doesn't know what they have coming in next. And if you knew the business, you would know that they don't have that information either. They see it when they see it. So yes, there will be REO everywhere. It's going to be dependent upon where you are. Massachusetts, there is so much piled up, but it's a very tough state to foreclose in. They won't see it, the real heavy stuff for another year or two. I had somebody in Tennessee just got like 25 listings assigned to them in one shot. 
So it really depends on the state. Even Florida, which used to be a relatively fast state, foreclosure is running about 1,200 days now. So a lot of this stuff got delayed. What was interesting is prior to COVID, we were projecting a really good REO year for 2020. There should have been about 750,000, which by the way, anything over 1%, the REO brokers are thrilled. Okay, because that's a, I told you how big that number is, you know, a percentage of the market. Um, but there should have been about 750 that were all delayed due to COVID. So what you've got is this huge backlog of people who haven't paid their loans in five or six years that just rode the moratorium wave. Well, that's going to start coming back. It's how fast they can get them through the pipelines because the courts are clogged up. So when it comes to you, it's going to depend on the state you're in. It's very specific. And I really, I mean, I can tell you exactly because I know the time frame for each state, but I can't because I'm allowed to teach REO to non-NRBA members. So consider that a trade secret type deal. So I probably said more than I'm supposed to. Wait, but but then that means people should visit nrba.com and join, right? That's... If you've got if you've got the REO experience, because we guarantee the clients the best people in the industry. We vet pretty hard. Uh, okay, let me so let me go to uh, Maria really quick, and we're actually almost at the top of the hour, so I should end things soon. But let me go to Maria, uh, ma'am. Thank you. You're speaking. You're speaking uh, music to my ears. Um, I was involved in the 2008 crash. Um, and um, have a, a pretty intensive um, knowledge is how they worked. It was not a a a, a listing uh, REO listing, which I think um, I really would like to get into that because that's really kind of down my cup of tea. But my question is, um, what? How do we find these sellers? that are in foreclosure is there a website is there a list that is provided is there something <clears throat> what is the best way to find or market to these people who are in the process of foreclosure one of the things that i did do back in the in 2008 was try to help a lot of these people sell their home before it went into foreclosure okay so um, okay let, let's tighten this question up a little bit. So you're asking me how you find people, distressed homeowners that need to sell. Is that the question you'd like to ask? Yes. Okay. Are we talking distressed from medical? And I have a reason for saying this. Is it medical, legal, divorce, job loss, or behind in their mortgage? There's all sorts of distressed situations. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring that up is because going after the pendants list to the foreclosure filings, which are easy to find, <laughs> the problem is you're too late. You're not going to get anything that way. Once that foreclosure has been filed, you're not going to get any make any money. And I'm going to tell you, because everybody says, oh, go to the foreclosure list. I've seen people write books on our, oh, how to get listings. Go check the foreclosure list. Let me tell yeah, you, what, that. it's not going to happen. Let me tell you what happens. Tim's in foreclosure. Tim wants to keep his house. Tim is emotionally attached to his house. Tim is in denial that he's really going to be foreclosed. And Mike over here comes along and say, hey, Tim, I can get you a new mortgage or I can get you, keep you out of foreclosure. Give me $1,500 and we'll start the paperwork. Okay, now I'm a scam artist. They're all over the place. Okay, why do these scam artists succeed? Because Tim, like every other homeowner in trouble, wants to believe there's hope. They don't want to believe, they'll, they will pay anything, believe anything anybody tells them if it's they can keep their house. Mm -hmm. All right? And the problem is by the time a list penance is filed, the scammers have already gotten to him. Probably four or five people have told him that they can keep his house for him. Okay. It's like attorneys. Oh, we'll file bankruptcy. You'll keep your house. We all know that doesn't really work. But you go to a butcher, they're going to sell you meat. You go to an attorney, they're going to sell you a lawsuit. Okay. You go to a doctor, he's going to try to give you pills. That's what they do. All right. That's reality. So chasing the list penance list, or the, you're too late. All right. You have to get to them before that point. Now, and I'm not a big fan of farming. I'm not a farmer, I'm a hunter. If you guys have been in this business, you know the difference, all right? But you have to promote yourself out there. And do you like doing door knocking, Maria? Um, no, I've never done it. Okay, then starve. And I'm, that's not to you, that's to everybody. Okay. Okay, you've got to get into the neighborhoods and talk to people, all right? Either knocking doors, putting up flyers, and flyers don't really work, neither do mailers. You know what do work are door hangers because everybody has to take them off the door and look at it. We have a really great one that we use 
that warns people of foreclosure scams. And you know what they do? They call us when they're behind on their mortgage instead. We used to use them all the time. All right. What you have to do is get out there. And when you're talking to the people, you guys all know how to door knock. And if you don't take a lesson on it or a class, I think I've got some videos on it somewhere on the site. But don't ever ask anybody if they're in trouble with their mortgage. It's insulting. Okay. You don't ask your neighbor's 16 year old daughter if she's pregnant either, even though she looks it. Okay. You just don't do these things. So one, the, the key to this is when you're talking to people, knock on the door, put out a flyer, whatever you want to do, say, you know, I'm here to help people behind in their mortgage. Do you know of anybody in the neighborhood who could use my help? Don't ever say it's them, okay? You'll hurt their feelings, even if they are in trouble and about to lose the house. Is well, there anybody, do you know of anybody in the neighborhood who could use my help? I, it's funny, but I have a family member that is going through that. And she is doing everything she can. Uh, I mean, it's one of those things where she's not giving up. Nope. She is not giving up. And I mean, it's like, no, no, I'm going to rent it. I'm going to rent it. And I'm going to get all, I'm going to get a million dollars for it. <laughs> Literally. She thinks her house is worth a million dollars. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough market. Unless you can automate it somehow or really work it. Because 90% of the people who need your services don't believe they need your services. Some of them believe they're going to win a lotto because God told them so. I mean, I've heard every story there is. I had one woman who told me, no, she got a letter from Ed McMahon. <laughs> Not a joke. She actually said that. No, I've got the letter. I'm going to win this. They, they told me I was. I'm like, okay. So yeah, about it, you later at the eviction. But, you know, because we get sent out to talk to these people when they're behind usually by a lot of the bank clients. And they're not really banks. So I shouldn't say that anymore that's changed um but yeah you what have to get to them to? without them What's i'm sorry that? what did they change to how is that process coming along if there's no longer banks handling <laughs> that okay there are banks let me okay i have to be very careful what i say here okay where does a foreclosure come from it comes from somebody who didn't pay their mortgage right stay with me that's called an npl a non-performing loan all right well the major banks chase um, Wells, all of them, they've been selling off their NPL. They don't want the media risk, the publicity, or the legal liabilities of foreclosing. So when a loan goes south and the people start paying, they sell it off to somebody else, typically a hedge fund or private equity group or a private fund. Fannie and Freddie have also sold off most of their NPL. So what I can tell you, and I can't go into details, I mean, the NRBA, we maintain a list of everybody who has REO and foreclosures. There's about 150 clients on that at any time that are active and have stuff for us. That's kind of a big trade secret of the group, by the way. We track that because it changes constantly. The point is the majors have sold the bad loans off. They don't want the risk and the, and the media headaches and the publicity. So the majority of foreclosures are hold, held by private funds. That's all I can tell you. That's why, by the way, just because this is one of my pet peeves. If you see an email that says, oh, hiring REO agents in your area, or areas now available, Chase, Wells, Fannie, Freddie, they'll have all the logos. They're just absolute bullshit scams because that hasn't been the case in a lot of years. And we see these scam artists all the time. We track them at the NRBA. The minute one of them comes out, we all see it. We run it down. And we like to really screw with these people because I've got members everywhere we will run down their address and send somebody there to go talk to one of our people just to screw with them and see who they really are. Because every once in a while, you find a real client. But um, they're scams. The problem is so many agents fall for these scams that they're still out there. There is one, there's actually two groups that we keep an eye on. They come up with a new name every single year and put out the same scam emails charging agents $400, $600, whatever. And I can't tell you how many calls I've gotten from, oh, yeah, I was scammed by these guys. Yeah, you were. You should have paid attention. Um, so don't calls. believe anything you see anymore. There's so many REO scams out there. I, yeah. I get those all the time. Yeah, all they're all scams. The Almost every one of them. Nobody. Here's the first rule. Anybody who charges you and guarantees you business is a scam because nobody can guarantee you business, including us. We'll tell you right up front. We don't guarantee anything. We have tools, information, resources, networking. All right. But nobody can guarantee you that because no client even knows what they have coming in next week. The pools of NPLs are being sold constantly. Um, even REO pools get sold. It just doesn't work like that and hasn't in a long time. Yeah. It's a full time job for us just tracking them. 
Well, so, Michael, yeah. on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. It is, a, I, I do my, I do my Wayne's World bow there. It is truly an honor. I haven't seen you in a couple of years, so. No, it's been a while. Like, matter of fact, when your email came over, I'm going, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. I could think about it for a second. Yeah, yeah, no. It's been I, a long I, time. Yeah, well, no, I, you know, I've been, I, I've been over here. I've been working with Sean. I absolutely love it. I, Sean is probably one of the most. I keep telling people this. I don't know if they believe me or not. He is probably one of the most wonderful human beings you will ever meet. I mean, he has, he has this amazing team knowledge and stuff. But I've never met anyone who is just as amazing as a person. Yourself, yourself, also. Right. I, oh, I'm going to put that out there, of course. But so I, I absolutely love working for Sean. But, you know, it's so it's wonderful. I, I should get you guys it, at some point. I'll get you guys together in a podcast. So yeah, not a problem. You know, I'm mostly retired. I play with my other stuff. So I'm, and I like the fact that I can say whatever the hell I want now, you know? Yeah. So, it's well, real simple. I, I'll, you know, I'll go on any show. Is, and the only rule is I can say what I want. We survived, we survived the 2008 and then yeah. we, we, all of us just made it through 12 monkeys basically two years ago. Right. So, yep. you know, I, I mean, we basically been through the end of the world twice. I, I think, you know, at this point, nothing, you know, we're bulletproof. I didn't see it as right? the end of the, the world. Hell, I bought two airplanes during that last crash. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I had a great time. I don't know about the rest of you, but I had a ball. Yeah. So, well, so let me let me point. We're we're just about out of time. Let let me squeeze in Mr. Torgerson, and then I'll I'll thank everybody again. David. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Uh, thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. Um, so it got me all fired up for REO, which is kind of inter interesting. But um, so I was on your website and it said that if we haven't worked with three REO companies, don't bother like submitting the information. Um, uh, so the the places that I worked with, I mean, they're smaller like local banks. I'm all the way up in the middle of nowhere in Montana. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how do I go about getting signed up with any of the larger REOs so that I can sign up with you? Uh, well, I'll tell you a few things. Um, I don't happen to have anybody in Montana right now, and I do get calls occasionally. But I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to get rich on REO in Montana for two reasons. A, there's nobody there, and people that are there actually pay their bills. Okay? So it's tough, but um, we can track down the clients. And even if somebody you haven't worked for for a few years, one of the things about REO is the business is very incestuous. So your asset manager maybe at a, was at a company that doesn't exist, but trust me, we know where they are now and we can find them because cool. nobody really leaves the industry. They just work for different companies. So if you have references, put them in and I'll see what I can do. Okay, and cool. We'll, we'll probably have somebody reach out to you because that's someplace I could use somebody that's willing to drive three hours. You know, Michael, that's what I, it is out there. But there's not much there. I wouldn't plan on making a living in Montana. No, I'd like, to, I'd, I'd like to use it to get my foot in the door, quite honestly, because uh, there are some other areas that I'm expanding to. Um, one of them I'm, I'm going to be physically moving to here by the end of the year. So okay. I'd like to, you know, try to get in now and, you know, learn the ropes and everything. And, and Understood. I, yeah. Michael, um, is there any way that I can maybe reach out to you personally? Because I like to kind of maybe go over a little bit some information that I have that might be of interest to you. Sure. Uh, can, can, I, can, can I drop your email? And... I cannot deal with any more MLMs. Okay. Well, let, let me. So let yes. me do this. Just uh, Google my name, my email, and my LinkedIn. Everything will come up. You can find me. I'm real easy. Okay. Yeah, Michael, is it okay if I paste the email to chat? Yeah, go ahead. That's okay. Fine. Okay, so his email is right there in chat. Yep, you to everyone. Okay, so you guys have that. So everyone, we are, we're just about out of time today. Michael, I genuinely, honestly cannot thank you enough. I think I've, I've probably known you close to a decade no, it's now. Not I was going to say, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah, I, it's it's been a while. And you have always been just this amazing straight shooter. And the NRBA has always been, had the highest standards. So that is absolutely absolutely amazing and i will work on getting you and sean together you will, okay, trust you will absolutely love him all right guys if you like this kind of information there's a site called free broker school which i put up just because i was pissed off at a lot of real estate coaches there's a ton of videos up there some of them are old but they still hold true and we got a new series going out there's no sales pitch or anything else it's just information that's good for brokers and agents take a look and you can google but search topics you probably find what you're looking for so now I will tell you, if you have a problem with profanity or anything else, probably not the place you should be looking at videos because we tell it like it is. This is how it works. Okay. But um, you can find a lot of good info up there. And I hope it helps you in your careers. That was my goal for it. Wonderful.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It you got it, guys. Take care.